I'm going to do this talk in the form of just giving like a few quick slides saying, you know, how stuff is done. Um, and then I'm going to focus on how is it the venture capital is so well optimized to deal with failure. And as I mentioned before, I think there's lessons in it, even though we're going to be looking at the, the practices of an industry, I think there's lessons in it, both for companies and individually. Um, as you know, like venture capital is a business, you know, a lot of what you back fails. And, you know, as Luis was saying yesterday, he's assuming eight out of the ten investments he makes fails. Can you imagine how hard that is? If eight out, you know, you try five things, four of them fail regularly, it really, you know, it really is tricky. How, you know, with that kind of horrific failure rate, how do you, you know, how do you succeed? So, like, one of the things is they have a lot of at-bats. In venture capital, you get to hit a whole bunch of companies. They don't all have to succeed. You just need a few to, you know, to make it work. That applies to, if we look at it from a company perspective, as crazy as that Afghanistan trip we did was, there was a principle where we did a bunch of at-bats. We were diversified. We tried three different approaches. It turned out that one of them, the afterthought really, the clothing was like something we decided to do, those shirts was something we decided to do in the last two weeks of the trip. It made a difference. Frankly, I think personally, you know, simply getting a lot of at-bats, you know, trying a lot of ventures. You know, I try a bunch of ideas. You know, I've had a lot of successes, but God, most things I try fail. You know, and most of the ideas I've done fail. And frankly, when I start, I have no clue. The point of that was to just show like, hey, some of these industry you know, practices can apply really personally and at the company level, at the personal level. So I've sort of said this, it's an industry with really high risk, with many, many losers. It's difficult to tell in advance. Like, you remember the question I posed to Luis yesterday? You know, can you recognize the winners? He says, not only I can't recognize them, I don't even try to judge them anymore. I think they're all winners. I turn out to be wrong 80% of the time, you know. This last point is really, really key to understanding it. Um, in venture capital, there's, you know, let's say 40 out of, you know, first of all, let's clarify something. I think most of us know this, but the rounds of investment, there's first of all, there's out of your own pocket, and then there's the round that you sometimes will do, which is friends and family, people that know you from before. And then maybe you go to angels, which are people making angels, and the numbers are rising. Typically, by the time you're getting to a venture round, you're talking about a very, fairly selective process. You're talking about at least seven figures. You know, it's at least a million or two. In this, their case, it was a $5 million round, the first round, venture round. So it's a fairly serious one. You know, so now going, so among the venture round, so among the ones that have really reached this, which means like, you know, 999 out of 1,000 are never even getting to this tier. You know, even out of those, a huge number are losers. And then some are winners, maybe there's doubles or triples. But then there's a few. You know, some of them are solid, 10x. So you get 10x returns on your investment, 20x. But what really tilts the numbers crazily is that some are 10,000 times return on your money. You don't need too many of those to really tilt the averages. Do you know what I mean? When you put up like a, ten, you know, a dollar and you get 10,000 back, that kind of return on investment what is that? A hundred thousand percent. It's ridiculous. It's not, you know, almost inappropriate to call it in percentages. You can see how it really ends up tilting the numbers. So you can have like 
five out of 10 lose, but then just because of that, it looks like, hey, this industry, you know, we have 45%, 35% return on equity year over year. These are insane kinds of numbers. It can really tilt it. So, and what's interesting is there's massive grains at the top, but, well, I'll come back to that. They, you know, these deals, the most attractive deals, there's a lot of hands in it. So when there's a big one, you know, there's a lot of wealth effect that that's, touches a lot of people. And I think over the course of the presentation, this will become clearer. So some real basics about venture capital. As a process, it's really, the life cycle is really simple. You know, a few people who, you know, who have some experience or whatever decide to create a fund and they raise it. You know, a small fund is, let's say, 50 million. A medium-sized round is 100 to 200 million. What they do is raise capital either from institutions like pension funds or universities. They're some of the biggest participants in venture investing or rich individuals. They invest in the fund, then, and they say, we're going to keep your money for about 10 years. So the people putting in the money, they're really putting it in for, you know, for a long stretch. You can't have your money back right away. Um, then they, they spend a few years investing the money. And, you know, they evaluate the deals, they do the due diligence, they close. You know, they finance the companies, they purchase equity in them, and they add value through some active participation. And then at some point, they have to exit because the investors, referred to as LP, limited partners, there's the general partner who are the organizers, the VCs like myself, originally. Then there's the limit partners. These are the people giving you the money. They want their money back at the end. They don't, you know, they want, they want it in some form of cash. So the fund needs to now exit in the form of an IPO which is the ideal situation. You do an initial public offering. That's typically the best returns. But the IPO window has really been closed. It's just opening right now, but it's, again, not, you know, there's a, several hundred deals in Silicon Valley, you know, that have been waiting years right now to go through the IPO window. And, you know, the market hasn't been that friendly, so there's a lot of pent up demand. But you either do it through IPOs, or in more recent years, it's much more likely through mergers. And occasionally you have the management buyout, but that's really the situation when um, it's a good lifestyle business. It's not, that's not considered a really great success from the VC's perspective. Yes? There's so much pent up demand. The Wall Street, the stock market is not really, is, has not been that open, has not been that interested in the IPO space. There was, there was some real buildup coming up to the Facebook deal, and lots of people did their S1 filings ready to go, and as you know, the, the Facebook IPO went horribly. That ended up pushing back a bunch of things. So, pushing back a lot of the demand and a lot of the, um, you know, the upbeat mood. It's building up again. But um, the, the, the mood and the state right now for going, you know, for doing IPOs is not strong. And most of the IPOs have even been foreign companies, a lot of Chinese companies, actually. Um, so you exit. So that's the, you know, that's the cycle. And then maybe you do another round. You do another fund. Um, you know, they, the, flavor, the VCs come in a whole bunch of flavors. Some of them deal only in early stage. Some do, you know, mid-stage or late stage. Some will only do mezzanine, like after round A, B, C, D, like just before going IPO. Obviously, the later you go, the lesser the returns are, and the lower the risks are also. Um, but what's amazing, to just follow up on the point I was making earlier about, you know, the IPO window isn't open, 
they're doing some venture rounds now with a valuation over a billion dollars. This is a non-public company, it's still a venture company. I mean, it seems crazy that it's still non-public and they're getting institutional money funds and sometimes private equity is investing at a valuation of a billion dollars. I mean, a billion dollars is a lot more than many, many, many public companies. So, in part, the closing of the IPO market is creating value, you know, is creating value really at the pre-IPO stage. So, there's some Y Combinator companies which are valued in their last round better than a billion. Dropbox is one. Um, Another one is that one where you say in people's homes instead of a hotel, Airbnb had around it a billion dollars, which is really quite, I don't know, it amazes me. So VCs are, you know, are segmented by stage of the venture. They're segmented by, you know, by um, vertical, you know, healthcare, green technology, information technology within that semiconductor or hardware or software or systems or whatever. You know, they're segmented geographically. VCs typically will focus on something or other. Now, you know, obviously there's a lot of VCs now working, US VCs now working in India or in China um, and in Israel. Um, but when they do that, they're typically doing it with uh, an office dedicated to it. They'll typically start, like right now you see a bunch of the VCs, they do long distance things, like Brazil, we're seeing some, uh, you know, Redpoint Ventures, which is a Silicon Valley fund. You know, it's, it's doing like basically a guy flies down and checks out some deals and comes back. They aren't really fully set up yet, but that's the next step. But the point is that they're separate. Besides that, in addition to the regular VCs, there's a whole corporate venture capital thing. Companies that want to invest for strategic reasons. And size. You know, some are small sizes, some are large sizes, large funds, etc. So, you know, VCs come in a whole bunch of ways. This is important for you to understand. You know, you don't just want a VC. If you have a venture, if you have a deal, you don't just want a VC. You want, you know, like a VC that's a mezzanine round investor is completely useful, useless to you. Or if he does healthcare and you're doing an IT thing, you know, so in looking at VCs, and it's really easy, you can tell from their website. And a lot of them claim they do a whole bunch of things. Look at their portfolio. You can tell right away, you know, what kinds of deals do they really do, not what they claim they do. Um, you know, but also it's important to note, being specialized, they have some real expertise on the stage that they do or on the sector that they do, and they can bring some value to the party. The investment process, it starts with initial contact where, you know, maybe you, you do it through an intermediary who knows the VC, maybe you do it through a uh, your accountant who's connected, or your lawyer, or whatever. Someone in the fund, it might be a senior person, it might be a junior person, will review your business plan um, and do some basic diligence, get a basic sense for it. You're, you're gonna go through those two cycles with a lot of people and nothing seems to happen. Then someday, someone might come through and, hey, he's actually really interested. You need to find a deal advocate, someone who says, hey, I sort of believe in this, because you need their support in going through the fund, through that particular fund. So if things go okay, at some point, um, this person who's now your deal sponsor, etc., and who's coaching you a little bit says to you, look, you know, you're in luck. You're going to be presenting next Monday to the partners. And typically these are partners meetings. They're held generally Monday morning where, you know, you're invited for an hour and you're supposed to come with your slide deck, your pitch, to present. I've never seen a presentation be completed. So you start 
and you start talking, and fairly quickly you'll be engaged in conversation. And it's not a good idea to say, well, let me get back to my preach or anything. Take the conversation and really engage. Depending on how that goes, generally speaking, you know, well, it depends. If you're successful in that and your, your sponsor can persuade the rest of the partners, hey, this is really a worthwhile thing to look at. Or if you don't, ex you know, you don't blow it during that meeting, like, you know, do something that clar clarifies, hey, this guy's not really ready for prime time or whatever. Then you go into a second level of due diligence, which is now, you know, it's a much more serious due diligence. It's more quantitative. You know, it's more serious. You then, this, this new level of diligence can take weeks. It can, you know, it gets fairly intensive. At that point, if you're lucky, you know, you need, you get basically unanimity among the partners in the fund. They will not fund you. If anyone in the fund says, I don't believe in it, you're not going to get it. If there is unanimity, and of course this is important, you're seeing how many steps there is in the way, then you will get a term sheet, which is, term sheets is a really important term to know. It's like the thing you're always dying for when you're trying to get funding. And it's the outline of a deal. It's typically like a three to ten page document, so it's easy to read and to comprehend. It's not super duper goobly gook. You know, the ultimate thing is a huge, massive document. This is the high level summary. You can think of it in, in terms of other contracts like a letter of intent or an MOU. Do we agree at a high level on, you know, and it will outline you know, the main elements, the how much they want to put in, at what valuation, you know, how much of the company they're going to be getting, you know, what special rights they have, etc., which we'll discuss. And then there's further due diligence. And I mean, due diligence, I mean, in the venture capital course, I go into it, people are always floored at the level of depth of the diligence. They really are. So like people think like, I won't tell them about this. Give me a break. You're being naive if you think they're not going to find out. You know, they, you know, they call their references. Hey, you got to say good things and stuff. I don't know. My experience with diligence is I don't care what your references say. Of course they're stacked. Of course they've been prepped. When I ask my team to do diligence, they ask, they call the references, and they say, and they'll do the conversation. Who else knows this guy, Joe Schmo? Who else knows him well, etc.? The reference will give a few names. They will then ask those guys, who else knows Joe Schmo? Those are the people they will believe. Those are the people they're really taking. So it's like two, two levels beyond the person that the references you've given. And they go, you know, and it goes deep. Because it's really, a, you know, and the VC has a responsibility to do this. People have entrusted them with large sums of money. You know, they can't waste it. And then you do the legal documentation and you have a deal. You have funding. You can see it's a multi-stage process. It's extended. Very few are selected. So I think you already have a sense of how do they deal with failure. They are very, very careful to start with. You know, the entire model lever presumes and leverages multiple failures. The deal with the entrepreneurs, the VC gives the VC control for course change. The entrepreneur poses a plan. They don't make the plan. At that point, the VC can step in and takes over. There's a new plan. And I will tell you structurally how they can do that. The VC might only own 20% of the company. Oftentimes, that's the case. But they have control. 
and it's really important. That's a, I guess maybe that's a really important thing to point out. People always think, oh, I have 50%. Who cares how many percent you have? The way it's structured, and I'll show you in a moment, is the VC has control. And the way it's done is there's two, there's two um, categories of stock. There's common shares, which is what the fund founders get typically. And then when the venture round is done, they get preferred shares. Decision making requires approval of all classes. So any decision which is viewed as strategic, hiring a senior executive, borrowing money, selling stock, you know, you can think of other major ones, but those clearly stand out. They require the approval of the common share players and the approval of the preferred class players. If the VCs have all the preferred shares, guess what? With their 20%, with their 5%, they could run the show. Um, also the VC, the way the deal is, is cut, some of you are gonna think, this seems unfair. But look, it's the power of money. Um, the VC is first in line on payday. The VC gets paid before the founding team gets paid. What's the deal with the limited partners? These are the people who are giving the funding to the VC. What will interest you is and I'll give you the details of how the compensation works. Um, the, when the, let's say the fund is a successful fund, and let's say, you know, over the course of the period, the fund makes 30 million, the VC gets 20% of that profit. So they get 20% of the 30 million, 0.2, you know, 0.2 times. They get 12 million out of it. The question is, what if the fund loses money? The VC does not share in the losses. The limited partners take it all. So the VC really is in a no-lose position. What he can lose is his reputation, which is a pretty big deal. But it's one thing to lose your reputation, it's another thing to lose all your money. Is there a question there? Or? Okay. What's the deal with other VCs? First of all, there's that home run phenomenon I told you about. When you have the occasional deal that does like a, just a huge 1,000x payoff, um, you can see how that could really scramble the game. And as a result, there's really broad deal sharing among VCs. The deal is, when I have a good deal, and I know I have a good deal, a really attractive one, I'm going to call up some of my friends. I may want the whole thing, but because I'm thinking of my long-term interests, my access to other deals, I'm going to call some of my, my friends, and I'm going to say, look, we have this deal, it's a beautiful one. If you want to take a look at it, you're welcome. And I'll bring you into the deal. What happens then is, you know, there's a lot of players in it. One, I've reduced my risk on the deal. I've also reduced my upside. But one of the effects is when you have a Google um, or a Facebook kind of a play with those kinds of crazy wild returns, there's, you know, there's a lot of wealth that's gone all over the place. So that enables a lot of bat bites on the few home runs, the few massive home runs that occur. And of course, if you look at the investment process, we looked at it, it's obviously very heavily optimized to op avoid losers, to avoid losses, and you know, funds get to participate at that a lot. 
let's look at the deal with the entrepreneurs. And here you're going to start getting, it's going to get a little bit technical. So one is reverse vesting of founder stock. In other words, yeah, you own 30%, but guess what? We're going to put a vesting schedule on your 30%. You have to be here. A lot of people do the deal like those guys in Up Down, right? You got 30%, you got 30%, I got 40%. Great. What happens if the guy leaves? He's got 30%. Sometimes, you know, there's a case, actually there's a film about it called Startup. So it would be interesting to show here, but we don't really have the time. But they had to, you know, they had a guy, they, it was three or four of them who started the venture. One of them kind of never got active, you know, and it was just sort of going on. The three were going along, and then, you know, the funding came up. They were getting this big multi-million dollar funding. Um, and the VC says, look, you've got to work it out with this guy and get him out. You know, we don't want some guy who owns this big chunk of the deal, um, you know, who's not working. Um, well, guess what? In that case, um, anyway, in that case, it cost them 750000 they or 700000 It was called the $700,000 mistake to get him out. At that point, they had to. They didn't really have much of a choice. Obviously, guys, you, you get a lawsuit among you, it's over, right? You get a lawsuit, someone sues you, it's over. Even if it's unfair, even if it's false, whatever. So reverse vesting of mandatory uh, founder stock, voting rights. You do have the voting rights on your shares, but if you require the two classes of, you know, you require a majority of the preferred class as well, well, you can have 80% that it doesn't matter. Voting rights means, you know, really veto rights. Liquidation preference. This is going to shock some of you. Liquidation preference means I get my, you know, like you might have a 2x, 2 multiple, 2x multiple on liquidation preference. I'm going to put in a million into the deal. I then, at the exit, first I get 2 million before we start dividing the money. Okay? I have my shares, but, you know, I get this liquidation preference. And you know what, in like the year 2000, when, you know, the bargaining power of the entrepreneur versus the VC, at various times it go, like in 99, the entrepreneur had unbelievable power with the VCs trying to grab them, trying to attract them. 2000 and the crash happened, and the, you know, there was no money going out. All these companies trying to do round B or round C. They're going, in some cases, they're doing really nicely. They just need money to get going. The VCs, frankly, some of the less ethically smooth would say, yeah, we'll do the investment, but they'd start asking for these crazy kinds of demands. In some cases, we want five times our money before you see a dime. In this one case, and you know what, this would especially be in cases where it would be a down round, where, you know, the market is down, and hey, you didn't meet your goal, so this is going to be a down round. At down round time, this is, you know, it gets horrible. So in this one case, the team, you know, it went all the way through. They did the deal, you know, they raised it, and the team walked out the next day they had to renegotiate. Um, options investing, it means basically you're locked in. You don't get, you know, it's not, you have to vest your share. Um, redemption, that's an interesting one. Um, sometimes you do these ventures, you know, 
if what you're describing is a deal that's, hey, is going to generate some pretty good profits, let's say, you know, 10% per year profit, which is for a normal company is considered excellent. You know, it's a safe one. It's not a very competitive sector. And, you know, the management team gets into a situation where, hey, this is pretty cool. We've got really nice jobs. We're working with each other. We like each other. You know, we've given, we're giving ourselves really nice salaries now. And, you know, it's a nice nine to five job. It's going along. Meanwhile, this company is not going to go lick, it's not going to do an IPO because, hey, it's just a comfortable, happy, we call it a nice lifestyle business. The VC has three million caught in there. He's never going to see it under these terms. As a result, in advance, there's a term, you know, they put in a term into the deal, which is redemption which means he can come to you, the VC can come to you at that point and say, look, we want our money back. We need to do a deal where basically we, you know, either through your borrowing or you give us, you know, or we get access to your cash or whatever, but basically you're going to buy us out. You're going to buy us out on a profit, at a profitable level. And, you know, and then we're out but they can force that event so that, you know, a lifestyle deal doesn't get in their way. And then there's anti-dilution, which is what happens if you have a down round next. A down round, you know, with these VC things, they give you little chunks of money to get you to the next phase, and then they give you a little bit more to the, go to the next phase. What happens if you fail getting to the next phase? then you're in a really bad la situation where um, you're really a, a, a little bit at the mercy of the next round of investors. And one of the worst ways they can do it is through anti-dilution. Anti-dilution means, yeah, we gave you $4 million at a valuation of, let's say, a um, dollar a share, right? Now, we're going to do the next round, and it's 50 cents a share. Because, hey, we're not as good. Anti-dilution means, if it's full anti-dilution, it means, you know what, let's pretend I didn't make the investment then. Let's pretend I'm investing now. So I get a lot more shares now without giving any more money. Where are these shares coming from? The founders. So anti-dilution is really a way of, you blew it, now I'm going to take back a lot from you. And these things, you know, these elements, the deal with the entrepreneur, you get control. That is, you know, the purpose is control. And through control, hopefully, um, preventing failure. And if it's failing, to have the means to change it. More on the deal with the entrepreneur. There's co positive covenants you sign to. These are our information rights as investors. This is things you will do. You're committed to doing. Negative covenants. Things you will not do without our permission. Representations. That's a really good one. Again, people who say, well, I, I won't tell them about this secret thing that's really important, this weakness we have, or this other thing. Even if, let's say, the due diligence proceeds and they never realize it. You have to say to them, I have given you all, I've told you everything you need to know. Everything I know that you need to know to make this decision. In other words, you're saying, you know, you have all the information to make the decision. The deal with the limited partners, this just gives you more details on it. The deal is, this is the carried interest. So VCs are always talking about the carry. Like within VCs, there's the deal. Who gets how much of the carry? That, depend, that really can wildly alter how much, how much of the action you're getting as an individual within the fund. 
But the carried interest is a term used to denote the profit split of proceeds to the general partner. It ranges from like 15% to 30%. Let's say Kleiner Perkins rose as much as 30%. Um, you know, some new funds might be 15% instead of the 20%. Some might have a threshold. You have to have a certain profit before it kicks in. Your 15% kick in. If the VCs are, let's say, first-time VCs, newcomers to the game, etc. But then the, the limited partners pay something else, which is the management fee. You can think of that as the salary for the investors, salary for the VCs. So let's say you raise a fund of, um, let's say, 100 million to, for simple numbers. Um, every year, as the fund managers, every year, you get two million towards your expenses. That's to pay salaries for the partners, for the secretaries, for your space, etc. That's just to keep things going. But you can imagine when these funds started doing billion dollar funds, hey, even the management fee is meaningful. That's 20 million a year. 20 million a year is very serious funds. Um, and you can see how the investors would go crazy. They raise a hundred, you know, they raise a hundred billion dollar fund, but then they're not investing it fast. It's like, hey, wait a second, I'm giving you 20 million a year to manage it. You're doing, you know, you're managing a much smaller fund. Um, but these are the two. Um, on the management fee, just, you know, like the whole Romney phenomena that we saw, the management fee the VCs pay regular income tax on that. On the carried interest, obviously crazily unfair, that's taxed at the capital gain tax rate. So you really do see it in the venture funds. The secretary is often paying a higher tax rate than the partners. It really is true because the secretary is paying income tax and the partners are paying capital gains tax. And it's just radically different. You guys see that point, right? Mm -hmm. Great. Um, you know, the whole broad deal sharing with the other VCs, you've seen that. It allows for big success while absorbing many failures and the impact of very large numbers. But the main point is, like the VCs getting the portfolio effect. And the VC is doing everything he can to keep the entrepreneur from the portfolio effect. The VC wants the entrepreneur to be in a do or die situation. You've got one play and one focus and one way to make a living and you're betting the whole farm on it. That's what a VC wants from the founder and from the, from the entrepreneurs running the show. Frankly, I'm interested, I have been interested in doing a venture we call equity exchange. I think it's a beautiful concept and it's being done by one small group I know on a very small scale. But it's really, I don't know if this is a good time to explain this, but um, the idea is if you get, let's say, you know, if we got 10, 10 founders into a room, Ten founders who have just done a round, let's say in the last six months, and to make it simple, let's say it's ten founders, they've done a run round in the next six, last six months, so it's fairly current deals. And um, naturally, these guys all have, on paper, they're, they're rich as can be. These guys, let's say, each has five million in stock in the company, on paper. The chances of this five, you know, yet their salary might be $100,000. You know, they can't go out to eat, to eat often because, hey, they're trying to live economically under that way. Their wife is probably saying, listen, we need some furniture or something. And, but, you know, no, honey, we can't afford it. Meanwhile, the guy has a $5 million net worth on paper. That seemed like a wonderful scenario for me to say, you know what, let's create a pool. You give me a uh, million dollars of your shares 
and let's put it into this one basket. We'll get each of you to put a million into this basket, okay? And then you each get 9% of the deal. I also get 9%, right? So what happens now? So now you've given up 25% of your holdings in that one play, but now you have 9% of another play. If any of the guys in this pool has a $100 million win, you're going to get $20 million divided between you, among the 10 of you. Hey, that's $2 million apiece. $2 million changes your life. $2 million changes your lifestyle. There's no longer any questions about eating out or about getting furniture, etc. So my thought was, that's beauty. It's perfect. You're selling really insurance to the entrepreneur. And we played with it a little bit. A couple of interesting phenomena happened. One, the entrepreneur will oftentimes say, look, I know you have some good entrepreneurs, but my deal is a killer, man. You think, who are your other guys, man? I don't think they're gonna be like, my, my deal is much better than these. I'm not, you know, I think I should get 20%, even though I'm putting 10% of the pool. So one of the things you notice with entrepreneurs is they really believe in their thing. And frankly, they think it's really better than any of the other deals. To me, it's like, hey, You've gotten a certain valuation. We're gonna, you know, you're dealing with the same kinds of VCs. It's worth something. The second thing you realize is the VCs say, no way we're gonna allow this. And they have terms in their agreement saying, the entrepreneur cannot sell his shares, which he's doing in that case. Do you see, do, do you guys understand the concept which I was outlining? In that situation, let's say they do this deal, 10 guys throw it into the pool, Chances are in the next year, you know, some really great event is going to happen for all these guys in that sense. So that some of that five million all of a sudden becomes real. Anyway, we're not doing it. Mostly because we think, you know, the resistance from the VCs is going to be horrific. We won't be able to really pull it off. Even though you know, from the entrepreneur's perspective, it's perfect. It's a hedge at a time when it's basically giving the entrepreneur portfolio effect, which he doesn't have any of. Um, so if you, sorry. So I guess this is, again, to summarize, how does venture capital deal with failure and effectively deal with failure? You know, oops, wrong slide. You know, it's multi-phase, it's in-depth, it's a deep evaluation process. The decision to invest requires the consensus of all the partners. That's a really high, high standard to be setting. Many VCs will only invest if other VCs go in a syndication. So it's not even good enough if all our partners believe do other partnerships also believe, that we respect. And of course it's multi-round, which means it's a short leash. You give some money, but then you want to see the results before you give a little bit more. And you know, it's broken up into all these phases. So the fundamentals really are just beautifully optimized for failure. Um, but, and that's really the interesting thing, in spite of all this, it's been the work, you know, Paul Graham and Y Combinator is scrambling the hell out of the VC model right now. Because in many ways, he, what he's doing, and also just the fact a lot of industry structure changes that have happened are making it so cheap to do a startup that in many cases VCs are really peripheral. There are deals that don't need VCs. You only need VCs in a situation where, you know, you need a large amount of cash early on. Frankly, a deal like we did, like Euro Profile, which I told you about earlier with those reports, those in-depth reports, that's the kind of business that just throws so much, so much cash off. That was just like a cash machine. 
you know, who needs a VC? You know, we were, in that business, we were doing dividends, large dividends, five months into the venture. In that deal, we were profitable by month three. By month three, we had recovered all the investment we had done to start it. By month five, we were giving dividends. A deal like that doesn't require venture capital. So that's one of the things. I don't know, this isn't a finance class. I'm getting far off from the failure thing. But when people look at ventures, they really they think about what do I love and all this. Yeah, I go for what you love. But also look at cash flow characteristics of the venture. Some ventures have amazing cash flow characteristics. And some have horrible cash flow characteristics. That venture which I told you about that we were doing, Euro Profile, the deal was you convince the cust once you convince the customer, he gave you up front a large sum of money. So like anyone we convinced, we got a minimum of twenty thousand dollars from them in return for a password. When you you know, and then we have to give them service for a year, but we have all you know, we're getting all the money up front. So they're funding their, their, the service that they get. And frankly, their funding, you know, the pricing was such as one customer would pay for the whole bloody report. So like everything else was like bonus. So, um, okay, that's the piece on, um, on venture capital. Are there any thoughts or comments or questions about intersection of venture capital and failure. Okay. Well, guys, it's really been fun working with you the last two days. And really, this has been one of the most active, engaged, interactive, and fun groups I've had. So it's really been a pleasure working with you. I'm grateful for your being here the full weekend. I've been asked to ask to give you some time to do the evaluation. I'd really be grateful if you could do it right away. And um, if there's no more questions or concerns, um, I'll close the class now. Thank you very much. As I said.